Today uh, we'll discuss the complete block count, which is CVC. But before we start, uh, it's uh, worth to remember the uh, pathophysiology of hematopoiesis. Remember that uh, the common progenitor cells referred as stem cells are located in the bone marrow and they give rise to all the immature cells first, which are the blasts. Those are called erythroblasts for the formation of the red blood cells, erythrocytes. Then um, would be the myeloblast. Myeloblast will actually form all the leukocytes that will discuss all the components in a minute. And megacardioblast, which is the actual immature cell for the formation of platelets. So it would be, again, erythroblast for the formation of uh, red blood cells, erythrocytes. Megacardioblast for the formation of platelets and myeloblast for the formation of all the types of leukocytes, which are right here. The reason I um, do a brief uh, introduction on hematopoiesis is because I want you to have in mind that the bone marrow goes from the most immature cell, which is the blast, to differentiating cells and maturing cells. When we discuss lymphomas and leukemias, you would see the reason why this type of uh, disease process has an abnormal accumulation of immature cells, which at this level are called blast. For the erythrocyte, again, they would have high increased density and production of erythroblasts for the platelets. The reason why they have thrombocytopenia is because they have an abundant amount of immature platelets, which are the megakaryocytes. And for the eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, and monocytes, they have a high component of immature cells, which in this case will be myeloblast. Three quarters of the nucleated cells in the bone marrow are continued to the production of leukocytes. They're committed for that. These stem cells proliferate and differentiate into granulocytes, which are your neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And the basophils give formation to uh, monocytes and lymphocytes, which together comprise the absolute white blood count. Approximately 1.6 million granulocytes per kilogram of body weight are produced each day. And from this, 50 to 75% of these cells are neutrophils. This is the reason why we'll do an emphasis on the most common causes of leukocytosis, in this case neutrophilia, and the most common cause of neutropenia. An abnormal elevation of neutrophils is neutrophilia, which occur uh, much more commonly than an increase in eosinophils or basophils. But anyways, we'll discuss each in detail. The maturation of white blood cells in the bone marrow and their release into the circulation are influenced by colony stimulating factors. Remember in pathophysiology, those are interleukin, tumor necrosis factor, and uh, complement components in the cascade. The cells within the bone marrow compartment are classified into two populations those that are in the process of DNA synthesis and maturation, and those that are in storage phase, awaiting release into the circulating pool. The storage of maturating, ma ma maturating cells allows for rapid response to the demand of increased white blood cells, 
in case there is uh, an emergency, a stress, an infection, um, an immune disorder. The circulating pool of neutrophils is divided into two classes. One pool of cells is circulating freely, and the second pool is deposited along the margins of blood ve vessels. When they're stimulated by either infection, inflammation, or drugs, or metabolic uh, toxins, the deposit cells demarginate and they enter freely into the circulating pool. Once the leukocyte is released into the circulation and tissue, it remains there only for a few hours, at which time cell death occurs. Remember that the uh, neutrophil is the first cell to migrate to the area of infection and inflammation. Estimated life, lifespan for the white blood cell is only 11 to 16 days. It's the first cell to migrate to the area of infection and inflammation and also the first cell to die and becomes pus. I hope you remember that in pathophysiology. This is another representation of the um, hematopoiesis. You have the um, myeloid progenitor and you have the lymphoid progenitor. The lymphoid progenitor is going to give you the natural killer cells, the T lymphocytes, and the B lymphocytes essential for the adaptive immune system. And the myeloid progenitor are all the cells that we just discussed. If you see the progenitor for the erythroid, which is the erythroblast, it's going to give rise to erythrocytes. The megakaryocyte or megakaryoblast is going to give you platelets. And the um, myeloid or myeloblast is going to give you rise to your basophils, your eosinophils, neutrophils, and monocytes. Again, this is another representation. And uh, the reason I continuously uh, give emphasis to this is because the more damaged to the bone marrow, such as in malignant uh, cells uh, or uh, disease process that will give rise to uh, malignancy, such as any myeloproliferative disease or myelodysplastic disease, such as lymphoma or leukemia, you're going to see a high prevalence of immature cells, and these are no more than blast. Let's talk about the normal values first before we start discussing about disease process. Remember that the hemoglobin really depends on gender. You have, for the males, it's from 14 to 18. Female is 12 to 16. Hematocrit is 40 to 54 for males and 37 for, to 47 to females. The uh, total iron binding capacity is 250 to 450. Transferring is no more than the area of storage and uh, transportation for the iron molecule. And you have values different for gen but depending on gender. The zero iron level is 50 to 170. Mean corpuscular volume is going to give you the size of the cell. And the normal size is 80 to 100. And we'll discuss in anemia later on. You would see that if the patient has is within the normal value, patient's going to have a normocytic type of disease process. If it's less than 80, it's going to be microcytic or uh, reduced size. And if it's greater than 100, it's going to be macrocytic, which is big size. Then you have the main corpuscular hemoglobin and the main corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, which is the one that's going to give you the color of the cell. 
And for example, for the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, which is normally 32 to 36, if it's within this normal value, the patient is going to have a normal chromic. If it's less than 32, patients would have hypochromic, hypochromic or hyperchromicity. And if it's greater than 36, they have increased color. Now, the problem is that you would see with the classification of anemias, you have only the choices of normocytic, normochromic, microcytic, hypochromic, and macrocytic, normochromic. And the problem is, the problem that um, hyperchromic does not exist is because when the cell is too big in size, the chromatid, which is the actual uh, component uh, of who gives color to the cell, is more dispersed and the ratio diminishes. And that's the reason why hyperchromicity does not exist. So in other words, the amount of color is normally distributed when the size of the cell is big enough. Let's talk about what these values mean. Hemoglobin, remember that the hemoglobin is the oxygen carrying pigment of the red cell. Hematocrit is the test for um, that measures volume of cell as a percentage of the total volume of the cell. In other words, is the ratio between amount of red cells and volume in plasma. This percentage is usually three times greater than the hemoglobin. After hemorrhage, for example, or excessive intravenous fluid infusion, the hematocrit will be low. If the patient is dehydrated, the hematocrit will increase. Normal levels in men and women were already discussed. Another value that will be later in another slide will be the reticulocyte count. These are the new cells released by the bone marrow. The reticulocyte count is therefore used to assess bone marrow function and can indicate the rate and production of the red blood cells. In other words, if the patient is bleeding and if the reticulocyte count is elevated, that means that the bone marrow is healthy enough to respond and start producing new red blood cells. Normal to slight elevated reticulocyte counts may occur with anemia, demonstrating an underproduction of red blood cells such as with iron or folate deficiency anemia because you need those cofactors for the bone marrow to be able to produce healthy red blood cells. Depending on the staging of the disease, elevated levels may indica indicate blood loss or hemolysis. Normal levels of reticulocyte counts are between 0.5% to 1.5%. Now let's talk about the uh, indices. These indices right here that I discussed that are very valuable for anemia classification. MCV, again, measures the average size of the red blood cell. And we discussed already if the low values is microcytic, if it's normal value is normocytic, and if it's high value is macrocytic. MCH is the average weight of hemoglobin per red blood cell. And MCHC is the average concentration of hemoglobin per erythrocyte. This is what I just explained. Reticulocyte count actually measures production. And it's good to be increased because when it's increased, that means that the bone marrow is healthy and ready to start producing new red blood cells in response to whatever etiology, bleeding, hemolysis, anemia, etc. 
of course, sometimes is reduced if the cofactors necessary for the production of the red blood cells or the metabolites, in this case, uh, folic acid, vitamin B12, um, vitamin C, calcium, etc., are not present. Remember that inside the hemoglobin, there is a molecule of bilirubin. Okay, we'll discuss in the next slide the metabolism of bilirubin and how patients with uh, hematological diseases or hematogenic diseases could have jaundice as well. And this is due by an indirect bilirubinemia. LDH is no more than lactic dehydrogenase. Remember that this enzyme is released during anaerobic metabolism and is due by tissue breakdown. So patients with hematological conditions also could have elevated LDH. LDH is not only present in infectious disease process or in a disease process that hypoxia is present. Also could occur when the patient is going through a tissue breakdown or hemolysis. So if the patient has an elevated LDH in the presence of anemia, this could mean that the patient is in a process of hemolysis or breaking down red blood cells. The normal value is less than 270 units per liter. Another one is haptoglobin. Haptoglobin is also present when the patient is going through a process of hemolysis and the normal values are 27 to 139. So besides all your uh, CBC and the anemia profile, you could also uh, measure indirect bilirubin, LDH, and haptoglobin if you're suspecting any type of hemolysis, including reticulocyte count, to see if that bone marrow is responding appropriately and is healthy enough to uh, counter, uh, counter, uh, counterpart the um, disease process. This is the metabolism of bilirubin. Just a quick uh, remind that you have, imagine that this is the liver, okay, this yellow box is your liver, and uh, normally we have an enzyme that is uh, called uh, glucuronic acid dehydrogenase that conjugates the uh, bilirubin once leaves the erythrocyte. So this is the, your normal blood vessel, okay? The red blood cell is actually navigating through the red blood, through the capillary, and uh, before reaching the liver, any type of disease process that produces hemolysis or any type of disease process that occurs at the level of the heart because the heart is the one that supplies um, blood through the capillaries. So if you have any type of cardiomyopathy or valvulopathy or um, any type of disease process that decreases uh, cardiac output would also produce anemia or hemolysis at the level of the capillary. Another disease process that could produce uh, hemolysis at the level of the capillaries are red blood cells that are malformed. For example, patients that have spher spherocytosis, spherocytosis, or sickle cell anemia. The cycling process at the level of the red blood cells produces hemolysis, and that hemolysis occurs at the level of the capillary before the liver. So the bilirubin that is being released at the level of the capillary by the erythrocyte due to either heart uh, problems or um, capillary problems or sickle cell anemia or spherocytosis will produce an increased level of indirect or unconjugated bilirubinemia and that produces jaundice, and that jaundice is prehepatic. On the contrary, once the bilirubin passes the liver and it gets in contact in contact with uh, glucuronic acid, that uh, bilirubin is conjugated 
So if you have any type of hyperbilirubinemia or jaundice, intrahepatic, that has to be due because of hepatitis or hepatocellular carcinoma or um, gallbladder problems such as cholelithiasis or cholecystitis or any uh, medication that could produce uh, liver damage or dysfunction such as statins, etc., chemotherapy, um, and many others. And if the patient has any type of uh, disease process just mentioned, that will produce an increased direct bilirubin or conjugated bilirubin. Okay? On the contrary, if it happens at the level of the small intestine, and basically it's the uh, areas that are connected directly to the liver, and that is the duodenum and the common bile duct by the biliary system. So if you have, for example, you have had cholecystectomy already, but there is a calculi located at the level of the common bile, bile duct, or you have duodenitis or pancreatitis, patients could have also jaundice due to by conjugated bilirubinemia or direct bilirubin. Normally remember that once the uh, red blood cell crenates and secretes bilirubin, that bilirubin goes into uh, the kidney and is excreted as urobilinogen. That's the reason why you have your urine uh, yellow and also is excreted through the um, intestine and feces and by the uh, bacterial protease is converted into stercal billing and that's the reason why your feces are also uh, yellowish uh, brown. Don't be overwhelmed about this uh, algorithm. It's just to uh, again stress out uh, possible causes of prehepatic, intrahepatic, and posthepatic uh, jaundice. If you concentrate here at this level before reaching the liver, you're going to have unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia and just uh, let's just mention disease process that could produce hemolysis or uh, heart problems or capillary problems that would destroy the erythrocyte before reaching the liver and getting conjugated. And those are, for example, just mentioned sickle cell crisis, blood transfusion, massive blood transfusions, um, patient, uh, hemolytic drugs, hemolytic anemia, such as ferrocytosis, any um, chemotherapy, for example, patients in hemodialysis would also have destruction of the erythrocyte. So any hemolytic process as well as cardiac process will produce prehepatic hyperbilirubinemia uh, or unconjugated. Examples of uh, intrahepatic, those are um, congenital uh, syndromes, um, hepatocellular carcinoma, you have also hepatitis, cirrhosis of the liver, again, hepatocellular carcinoma, um, Patients also could have post-hepatic in the conjugated um, hyperbilirubinemia. And those are, again, um, your duodenitis, your uh, common bile duct uh, obstruction, uh, pancreatitis, cholangitis, etc. Other causes that could produce this as well uh, would be excessive burns, uh, recent surgeries, prolonged immobilization, uh, patients with uh, chemical irritants and uh, chemotherapy, um, metastases and obst obstructive uh, tumors, etc. Let's talk about leukocytes. Leukocytes, uh, remember that, are the actual cells that fight infection. It produces chemotaxis and phagocytosis. Um, 
is in charge of getting rid of uh, encapsulated foreign organisms and destroy them. Remember that uh, they produce, they transport, and distribute antibodies. Leukocytes uh, is the, the most common laboratory finding um, that we try to look for uh, besides hemoglobin. Uh, and the one that we uh, most of the time concentrate is uh, leukocytosis. Uh, is most often due to relative uh, uh, benign conditions such as infection or inflammatory process. Much less common but more serious, more serious causes include uh, primary bone marrow disorders. The normal reaction of bone marrow to infection or inflammation leads to an increase in the number of white blood cells, mostly uh, polymorphonuclears, which is the uh, neutrophils, which you remember in pathophysiology whenever you have elevation of neutrophils and bands, which are the immature type. You have uh, left shift. Physical stress, such as seizures, anesthesia, overexertion, emotional stress, can also elevate white blood cells. Medications commonly associated with leukocytosis you would see that includes corticosteroids, uh, lithium, beta agonist, etc. The function of uh, leukocytes uh, it regulates the endocrine system. That's the reason why, whenever you are under stress or any type of stress to the body, such as infection or inflammation. Uh, WBC would be increased. Um, it has uh, uh, a function at the level of the hormones. Um, is in charge of producing uh, leukocytes as storage. And also remember that it has a very short uh, lifespan or the first that migrate to the area of infection and the one that first uh, disappear as well. You have uh, different types of leukocytes. You have the granulocytes, and those are neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, and you have the A granulocytes, which are the lymphocytes and monocytes. Neutrophils. Participate in pyogenic infection, such as bacterial infection. Remember that when you have elevation of bands, which are the immature type, basically you have a shift to the left. When you have the segmentus or the mature, the lymphocytes are highly um, related to viral infections, such as mislis, rubella, mononucleosis. And uh, this is the right shift. And the monocytes are basically present when you have a severe infection by phagocytosis. Again, the neutrophils, the function of the neutrophil is to destroy and ingest, ingest the bacteria. Again, I can't emphasize more. Neutrophils are right first at the site of infection and inflammation. Therefore, their number will increase greatly immediately after an injury or during an inflammation process. Bands, these are occasionally referred to as STAPS, S-T-A-B-S, and are immature neutrophils which are released after injury or inflammation. The presence of bands indicate that an inflammatory process is occurring. An increase in the release of immature cells is known as shift to the left. Eosinophils, these are found in such areas as skin and in the airway in addition to the bloodstream. They increase in number during an allergic reaction 
inflammatory reaction and parasite infections. The normal levels are 0% to 7%. The basophils, cold basophils, when found in blood, these cells are also known as mast cells. I don't know if you remember that the mast cells are the ones that first degranulate and release all the pro-inflammatory mediators. Tissue basophils are found in the gastrointestinal and respiratory tract and as well as the skin. They contain heparin and histamine and are believed to be involved in allergic and stress situations as well, as well as parasites. But remember, this is the main function of the eosinophils. Monocytes, these cells arrived at the site of infection in about five hours or more, so very late. The monocytes are phagocytic. They remove foreign materials such as injured or dead cells. Microorganisms and other particles from the site of the injury, particularly during viral or bacterial infection, monocytes travel when this is happening. The lymphocytes, again, um, they fight viral infection. B cells and T cells are the major two types. Lymphocytes have a key role in the formation of immunoglobulin, remember your humoral immunity, and also provides cellular immunity. And the normal levels are 16 to 45%. So what are the conditions that um, leukocytosis could be normal or physiologic? And this is important to know. Stress, any time uh, your uh, fight and flight or your sympathetic system is stimulated, leukocytosis is present. Any type of excitement, fear, anger, joy, exercise, and steroid administration. Do not forget this last. When leukocytosis is um, actually uh, pathological, well, leukocytosis is pathological in the presence of infection, inflammation such as tissue necrosis, infarction, burns, seizures, anesthesia, drugs again such as corticosteroids or lithium, Beta agonist, because remember, your sympathetic system, whenever it's stimulated, you have leukocytosis, although physiologic. So if you administer a patient a beta agonist, they could have leukocytosis as well. Splenectomy. Remember that the spleen is one of the organs that participate in hematopoiesis. And it's a lymphoid organ that produces uh, immunoglobulins and antibodies. So if you remove the spleen, uh, the bone marrow will defend itself to produce leukocytosis. Patients with hemolytic anemia, any type of myeloproliferative disease, such as le leukemia or lymphoma, Medications, medications that uh, could produce uh, leukocytosis uh, were mentioned already, such as lithium, uh, beta agonist, corticosteroids. What about the opposite, neutropenia? Neutropenia is present, for example, in Aplastic anemia, that means that the bone marrow is not working properly. You could have uh, other disease processes such as no gamma globulin production, congenital disorders, 
secondary neutropenias, uh, alcoholism, autoimmune disorders, HIV, cancer, drug-induced neutropenia. Examples of uh, drug-induced uh, neutropenias are um, phenobarbital, for example, phenytoin, penicillin. Patients uh, that um, are taking PTU. PTU is propyl thiracil, remember. Um, instead of uh, altosplenia or splenectomy for neutrophils or leukocytosis, in this case is hypersplenism. For example, if a patient just recently had mononucleosis uh, and they have uh, splenomegaly, this could produce neutropenia. Infectious process. Infectious process when they're overwhelming, instead of producing leukocytosis, on the contrary, they have decreased neutrophils. Let's talk about red blood cells. Red blood cells, remember the main, fu the main function just mentioned already is, the, to, is the, uh, to carry oxygenation, actually has the highest uh, uh, carrying oxygen capacity from the lungs to the body and then to the tissue. And they also transfer the carbon dioxide back from the tissues to the lungs. The red blood cells uh, evaluate anemia and polycythemia. When you have uh, decreased red blood cells, you have anemia. When you have increased red blood cells, you have polycythemia. Red blood cells, um, basically you have the hemoglobin that we discussed already, the hematocrit. We discussed the values for the uh, mean corpuscular volume and the mean corpuscular volume uh, hemoglobin concentration. And remember that when you have uh, 80 to 100 is an approximate value for you to remember, you have normocytic. When you have less than 82, you have microcytic and when, or, or 80. And when you have more than 100, you have macrocytic. And that's for the classification of anemia. And if you recall back in uh, pathophysiology, examples of normocytic, normochromic type of anemia, is either the bone marrow has no time to respond because the patient is profusely bleeding or the patient has had time enough to respond because of a chronic disease. So examples of normocytic, normochromic type of anemia is hemolysis, profuse bleeding such as in trauma, or any type of chronic disease. Microcytic, hypochromic anemia would be the most common iron deficiency anemia following thalassemia in pediatric population. Examples of macrocytic, normochromic, the two most common examples are vitamin B12 and folic acid deficiency. This was just explained already. This is again the same values for you to refer back and forth. This is again the definition of the uh, indices. The mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration is the average, average concentration of hemoglobin in the red blood cell. Uh, most value in uh, monetary therapy for anemia. Remember, this is your color as well as this. Platelets. Platelets are basically uh, clotting factors. Remember that the platelets uh, migrate as well uh, when a patient has an injury to be able to form the clot. It basically participates in hemostasis. Various mechanisms for hemostasis 
include, remember, endothelial cell nitric oxide release and uh, prostacycline. They promote uh, f uh, blood fluidity by preventing uh, platelet stasis and dilating intact blood vessels. These mediators are no longer produced when the vascular endothelium is disrupted. Under these conditions, platelets adhere to the damaged intima and form aggregates. The initial platelet adhesion is uh, due by the uh, factor, von Willebrand factor, previously secreted by the endothelial cell. Von Willebrand factor binds to receptors on the platelet surface membrane by the glycoprotein 1B and 2B. Platelets anchor to the vessel wall, they undergo activation. And during activation, platelets release mediators that forms granules. That includes the uh, ADP, as well as other fulfolipids, um, calcium, and also arachidonic acid, which is converted into thromboxane. This reaction requires cyclooxygenase that if you give aspirin or NSAIDs, will reverse this uh, cascade. The platelets are formed in the bone marrow cells. They have a lifespan of seven days, approximately. And they're taken into account when you're evaluating bleeding disorders or um, liver, uremia, when patients have this type of etiology, it's very difficult for the playlist to attach to the uh, area of uh, injury. Examples of uh, thrombocytopenia or causes of thrombocytopenia include, for example, um, gestational thrombocytopenia, which is uh, a physiological condition. Um, a plastic anemia, where the bone marrow is not working properly. Uh, leukemia. Patients that have diminished their platelet production because of alcohol, because of HIV, or because they also have a deficiency of cofactors that produce red blood cells, they would have deficiency of uh, platelets as well. So if the patient have vitamin B12 or folate or iron deficiency, they could have uh, thrombocytopenia as well. Remember that the platelets are formed in the bone marrow and destroyed by the spleen. So if the patient has any type of uh, splenomegaly by another disease process, the spleen will be severely activated and will start destroying platelets, believing that is an early stage of uh, cremation or uh, death, or that the lifespan has ended. And this disease process could include uh, viral conditions or, uh, for example, mononucleosis or influenza any type of uh, sequestration, such as cirrhosis of the liver, um, any immunological destruction when patients have uh, drug-induced uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, autoimmune disorders, such as lupus and scleroderma, um, disseminated intravascular coagulation is another important disease process that could produce thrombocytopenia sepsis sepsis is a big one patients with sepsis not only they could have leukocytosis they could have neutropenia they could have thrombocytopenia any uh, stage of the of the hematopoietic uh, stem cell damaged infections as i said cytomegalovirus epstein barr virus dengue hepatitis Acute respiratory distress syndrome also could produce uh, thrombocytopenia. And of course, 
the thrombotic, uh, thrombocytopenic, uh, purpura hemolytic uremic syndrome, or um, the idiopathic thrombocytopenia as well. If you have massive red cell replacement, such as in hemodialysis or transfusion, you could also have thrombocytopenia because of that. On the other hand, examples of uh, thrombocytosis could be um, genetic. It could be uh, the patients have uh, alterations in uh, phospholipid syndrome, hyperhomocysteinemia. Infection also could produce that. Cancer. Cancer is one of the uh, conditions that have to be ruled out in the presence of uh, thrombocytosis. So what are you responsible to know for the class? You need to know the normal values. You need to uh, know examples of uh, different disease process, anemia classification. So basically uh, what we have gone over and uh, brief um, pathophysiology. Once you uh, transfer to uh, your specialty courses, we're going to uh, discuss in detail um, treatment and diagnostic evaluations for all these diseases. Thank you for your attendance.